We're going to start the um, public hearing section of the meeting. Uh, we have uh, Siemens uh, to talk about the cogen plan. My name is Jeff Duncan with Siemens, Steve Cummings, and Dave Kimmy. I um, wanted to talk to you guys tonight in regards to the Cogen switch gear replacement. Um, we've had a couple repairs that we have proposed to the district since there's been some issues going on with the plant. Um, basically, we just wanted to speak about the proposals and let you know what is actually included with the repair and the options that are there, and then if there's any questions you may have amongst the proposals, we'd be glad to answer those for you. So, um, first one it's called Cogen Switchgear. It's the replacement of the two HMIs. And basically the HMIs is a, HMI is a human machine interface. So basically it's the touchscreen processor that is on the front of the uh, Cogen door panels. So each generator along with the bus tie panel and the diesel itself all have a Small TV screen, probably about the size of the laptop in front of you, and that has all the controls that runs each piece of equipment. Um, what's happened with is the diesel itself, the HMI has failed on it. And what's happened is, is that's not allowing um, our technicians to be able to go in and control that piece of equipment. So it's, as an example, if the diesel goes into an alarm, it's not, we're not, and it shuts down, Right now, at this point, we're not able to go in and clear that alarm and refire that generator in the event of an emergency. So um, I guess a good example of that would be like your cell phone. If, you're, if you ever had your cell phone and your, and your touchscreen pad goes bad, but your phone's ringing, you can't answer it, but it's ringing, but it don't work, that's basically what's going on with this touchpad. So um, that option would allow us to upgrade the HMIs for both the diesel and generator two. Um, generator one and the main bus type panel have already been replaced. Um, by replacing these two, this will allow us to have them all on the same platform where then we can upgrade the software to the latest revision to get everything communicating on the same level because right now what's happened is that some of the softwares are speaking on different languages and speeds. And what's happening is that's causing some issues with the gear itself. So this plan here comes with a two year warranty. And, um, and basically that would get us back to have control of the diesel itself. Um, so that would be option, that'd be option one for the, H, the two HMIs. The second proposal that we have in place is for the GCM. And these GCMs is the generator control module. And can, Steve, can you speak to more of this one? Because basically for the generator control modules, what this is, is this is kind of like the, this is the brains of the, the generator itself. It would be like the computer that you would have in your car. So if your computer in your car fails, or starts giving you problems, your car may not run correctly, the timing may be off, or you may have issues with starting and, and other functions. The GCM, it works the same way. This is the brains of the, of the generator to the switch gear itself. It's the communication between the engine and the gear. So am I saying that right, that the generator control module basically tells the engine how to operate, how to adjust speed so that the voltage can be matched for frequencies um, so that you're getting good voltage out of the generators. So um, what's going on with these is that, and this is where I need Steve to speak. Yeah, it, and I think you're all aware of some of the problems you've been having, experiencing in the high school, some of the electrical blips you're uh, reporting or, or discussing. The, the physical structure of the plant is solid. It's the electronic software package. It needs to be upgraded. If we upgrade just the GCMs and all the each units and the two touch panels, you're going to gain much more stability, much cleaner power, and uh, we can put these issues to bed. 
So the, so the mechanical side is, is solid. It's, it's just the electronics. And I'm guessing a lot of these are still like original designed electronics and with software upgrades and things along those lines, they're just not tying all together anymore. Yeah, Correct. over the years, um, I, I've been here since the plant came online in 2004. So I've worked with Dave Martin. I mean, we've been here every possible evening you could imagine. And some of the components have been updated over the years. Others are original. And some of these components, they're, they're no longer available. So you've got old components, new components. They're not talking. They're not talking on the same speed and network they need to be. So it, it's been giving a, a bit of a, a hiccup, if you will, on how they load share, how it determines whether one engine comes on and goes off properly, uh, depending on school load. Yeah, and, and to Steve's point, yes, yeah, some of these parts have become obsolete. And back in the last fall, we ended up, Dave, I believe Dave Martin was able to find one like online, a used one that we were able to take and ship out to have it checked and tested and we're able to put it in. So we don't wanna leave the district in any type of a situation where this plant is vulnerable because we can't support it. And some of those parts, just like I said, aren't, aren't out there anymore. The, the core of your plant is still fine. The, the engines are industrial design. They're meant to last until parts are not even available, which is 30, 40 years. So I've rebuilt these engines oh, several times. And that, that itself, and, and you know, the main core is fine. It, the biggest problem is, is your diesel. If the diesel goes down, we don't have anything to support the plant. And because I can't see into the PLC, the touch panel is completely not working. I can't go in there and I can't control any backup assistance for the plant. That's really where we're, we're struggling with. We don't want to expose uh, the district to a problem. You know, we want to keep 100% uptime running for you guys. So, so GCM ones, that was option two, or, and um, that one also comes with a two year warranty as well. And then the, the last and third proposal is for the switch gear control power upgrade. Um, this one here would be basically to go through the entire switch gear and just upgrade it. Um, they would remove all of the touch screens and, um, and replace it with one main touch screen in the middle that would control everything. And then Dave, you said like all PLCs, G GCMs, yeah. HMIs, all the hardware, all the hardware in the gear itself would be replaced except for the actual structure itself and the bus bars and the actual breakers in the, in the lower cabinets. So those are the, those are the three options that were proposed. Um, and I don't know if anybody has any questions. So it's, uh, so it's one, two plus three. So there's three being the backup. Three is the emergency diesel backup. All the proposals. Yeah. Yes. So yes. it's, it, so number three does not include one and two. So it's one, no, two exactly. and three. Correct. Okay. Correct. And, and what's yeah. the Um, option one is for the H two HMIs in the software upgrade is 45,000 and change. And then for the GCM ones, um, with, for the generator controllers modules with the software, um, is around 83,000. And then the full control upgrade for the plant for everything to be upgraded, all the hardware is 223,000. So we're looking at well over $300,000 for, for this, correct? No, no. You could, do, you could do option one for the two HMIs and that would get you control of the diesel itself. 
So that would allow you to be able to go in and clear the alarms for the diesel and in the event there and get everything on the latest revision of software so everything is communicating on that one platform. Um, option two could go along for the GCMs. Option two is one and two together. Right? No. Not really? No. Option two is to replace the GCMs and that would, that would include the software and that would be for the degenerator control modules. That does not include the HMI being repaired or replaced on the diesel itself. So gentlemen, option three, which is the most expensive option, um, you would recommend if uh, this board and this district were planning to um, use the cogent plant for the next 30 or 40 years. I believe that's the time frame you, you mentioned a second ago. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend option three unless you were looking to exactly run this plant for another 30 to 40 years, make it or continue running it as a parallel peak shaving plant, or if you were going to be adding generators to the system, or even looking if down the road you were thinking you were going to continue to run the plant and upgrade the engines, something along that line for long term. Correct. So kind of option one and option two are kind of must. They give us the most reliability. They're going to give us the most control and, and put the most stability back in the plant. Three was important also. No, three, three is an option if you were going to continue running the plant and wanted to upgrade it because you were planning to run another 20 to 30 years. Yes, yes. Options one and two will go beyond that two years, three years you're looking for. Yes. So to, so to Don's point, one and two, I mean, it's, we have to do one if we're going to, we're driving blind if we don't do one. Yes. Two really should be done. Correct. And three, if we're, it, it doesn't need to be done if, if capital project uh, passes, which we sincerely hope, then we're going to take cogen out and we'll be in, in a much better shape for the future. Yes. And just so you are aware, uh, Intercon doesn't look at it uh, option one, two, or three as a one or two year fix. As far as they're concerned, this is a, a 10 year, 15 year. So if, if, if it didn't work out where you guys didn't decommission the plant, you would be safe to run it three years, four or five years or, or something like that. You would have that option. Yeah, if, 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 they, if plans change with your capital project and like Steve said, you needed to run three, four years, you'll be, you'll be well fine with this. This isn't a Band-Aid, it's, it's a, you know. Or we need three also. No, with one and two. One and two. Oh yes. It actually comes with a two year warranty. So for the time period you're looking for, you'd be covered through the warranty period, the time the plant's online. And this is the latest HMIs and software and stuff like that, where technically we probably could turn around and sell it on the used market in three years. Yes, that could be an option. Yeah. Yep. And one thing I would even suggest for future plans down the road would be even the, you know, you have a good, you have a good diesel engine outside now that can basically run the whole school, basically almost the whole district. And, you know, you already have switch gear in place that's going to be upgraded or for the, for the diesel. So one thought could be, even if you are going to decommission the plant, would be to hold on to the diesel and that one section with the bus tie for the diesel itself and make that an EGP panel, which is an emergency power generation. And that would allow you to have automatic standby for the high school, middle school. Um, it's already there. I mean, the wires are there, everything's ran to the building. It's just a matter of the PLCs and stuff's in place is probably some programming and maybe a couple small components, but it would be something that would, you know, 
probably be benefit the district and the vestments already there. So you're saying that could be like a generator, correct? Yeah, it could be backup power. Absolutely. So these parts that you would be purchasing could still take you into the future. And just be used as a backup generator for that diesel. So all I'm saying is don't get rid of the, all the gear. If you're going to get rid of the gas engines and the sections of gear for the, for the, for the, the gas generators, but hold that section for the diesel and turn that into a emergency power. We've purchased used parts in the past. I'm, they're all new parts and that there's these proposals. Yes, all correct. Things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is all the latest platform. Absolutely. Any other questions? Mike, did you take note of uh, this in the, for your, your next proposal? <laughs> all right, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The purpose of the public hearing is so that we can tap into the reserve for a repair reserve without having the requirement to repay it within two years. So at the next meeting, the board will vote on whether or not to allow the use of the repair reserve. This will help us in our current economic times to protect our budget from this extreme cost. Sounds good. All right, 719, we're gonna call the Board of Education meeting to order. Please stand for the pledge. We're starting with Board of Appreciation, Board of Education Appreciation presentation. To touch it okay good evening you have a array of different belongings up there from GLP and Eden Elementary um, I believe GLP gave you a gift card to Tim Horton so you can enjoy that either this evening or tomorrow morning and have a cup of coffee on us we want to thank you for all the things you do for us and support our teachers and our students you have always been magnificent at doing all of those things and supporting all of our ideas and things for our students particularly during COVID, so thank you so much. You have some student artwork. Um, there's some hand sanitizer up there with some student handprints right by your working station. And you have brown bags from Eden Elementary full of goodies. And particularly, there's a tray of Hello Dolly bars up there that were made personally by Mrs. Bauer, who is one of the Secretary's at the GLP main office, so she sends those from the GLP with love, thanking you for all that you do. So again, thank you. We appreciate you and all of the time you put in to support our students, our staff, and our school. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carter. Sorry, I just shut it off. Good evening, Board of Education, Mr. Sorticio, Ms. Feldman. On behalf of Eden Middle School, we'd like to just thank you and show our appreciation for your work as a Board of Ed. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our middle school student council advisor, Mrs. Doctor. We have a couple students here as well. We're gonna introduce themselves and uh, 
hand out some thank yous. Good evening. Uh, we have five members of the Eden Middle School Student Council here tonight to thank you. Hello, my name is Evan Ecker. Hi, my name is Trinity Gano. Hi, my name is Amelia Boltiniak. Hi, my name is Kaylee Burfield. Hi, my name is Chloe Giuliano. The Eden Middle School Student Council would like to say thank you to all of you for your service. The Eden School District is very fortunate to have such thoughtful and dedicated community members guiding and supporting our organization. Thank you all for what you do. Great job. So uh, this week is School Board Recognition Week and um, us on the High School Student Council would like to recognize our board members, um, our um, president, Mr. Don Sutton, our VP, Ms. Jennifer Horschel, Ms. Cheryl Carpenter, Ms. Ellen Kindly, Mr. Jack Cudahy, Mr. Alan Silver, and Mrs. Marlene Glender. And Mrs. Lauren Feldman. And Ms. Lauren Feldman. The New York State School Boards Association recognizes October 19th to 23rd as School Board Recognition Week. This is a time to promote awareness and understanding of the important work performed by school board members. Eden Central Schools are joining all public school districts across the state to celebrate School Board Recognition Week to honor local board members for their commitment to Eden and its children. Uh, school board members take one of the most important citizen uh, responsibilities, which are overseeing the education of the community's youth. Um, they're responsible to gather local school systems and ensure public schools are flexible and responsive to the needs of our community. Our school boards are com um, comprised of volunteers, most of um, whom do not see receive any compensation for their service. They are individuals within the community who dedicate their time to improve um, public education. And school board members just across the state um, collectively oversee more than 2.4 million K through 12 students and 85 billion in budgeted spending. The key work of school boards is to raise student achievement by creating a shared vision for the future of education, setting the direction of the school district to achieve the highest student performance, providing accountability for student achievement results, developing a budget that aligns to uh, district resources to improve achievement, and supporting a local healthy school district culture in which to work and to learn and much more. And our board members here at Eden do all these things phenomenally. Um, Eden School uh, Board members give Eden citizens a voice in education, decision making, and the contribution for um, each one of you guys on the board. Um, it's a year round commitment, and especially during these circumstances with the COVID 19 pandemic, the Eden School Board members, um, you all have gone above and beyond for us students, our parents, and the community to attempt to make this year as smooth and as safe as possible. We want to give a huge, huge thank you uh, for that on all of our um, behalves. And you guys lead so us as students can achieve. And to say thank you to all of you, there should be a small purple note card with a Tim Hortons gift card in there from our entire student council. And there should be some messages in there from people who oversee us too. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Is that Mr. Gould in the back corner? Come on, go sit in the middle. <laughs> you spent a whole, how many days in Canada in the corner? <laughs> Welcome back, you did a great job.
Good evening. Um, we're here tonight to present to you uh, the Eden 2020 Capital Improvement Project that's being proposed. So tonight for the agenda, first with introductions, my name is Nick Humphrey, Vice President of Campus Construction Management. And I'm Mike McCarthy from Young and Wright Architectural. So tonight we're here to um, go through what the proposed capital improvement project looks like. We'll go over the project development, how we got to where we're at. We'll review the scope and budget. We'll go through some images and pictures of what's proposed. And we'll also talk about the schedule. And then if you have any questions or comments, um, we'll address those at the end of the presentation. So we first wanted to hit on where we were and how did we get to this current point that we were at. And as some of you remember, there are some people on the board that were at some of these meetings. Back in 2014, we started working with the district uh, along with citizens, uh, a lot of the community members, teachers, students. We did Saturday meetings, we did all sorts of stuff. And we started with a large list uh, that was gathered from the building condition survey that the state requires, uh, which puts an estimate to some of the repairs for the district. We started with about $75 million back then, and we had to get that down to an amount that we could have in a project. So we went from 75 to about 55, and we ended up at about 22, which was where the last project was. So that was in 2015 that we developed that. That project was finished in 2018. Now, the rest of those things that didn't happen in that project didn't go away. So now we're here again to look at that project and, and see what's left. So in 2019, we revisited that list, went through it. We met again in October with the community, students and, and staff, and began working on a new list for the current project that we're here to talk about tonight. So kind of part of what I'm discussing, uh, we work with the district with a long-term plan. So on the far right of the screen, um, you can see there's a large list of items and it's nothing that we're gonna read through tonight. But this is where we started before the last project. So that list that we started with was comprised of the far left category and the far right. We worked all the way to get everything on the left completed in the last project. So all those items on the right still existed once that project was over. So we worked with the district over the following years, uh, along with the director of facilities to complete some of those projects on that list and get it to a more manageable amount. Fast forward to today, we have a little bit uh, smaller of a list, um, but with the same items on there that we didn't complete yet, and we were able to create a, a project for uh, this time period. And like we were talking about, the items that are still on the right, those are things that we haven't addressed, and we don't want to forget about them. We want to make sure things uh, stay current and we're able to work on those throughout time. All right, so now I'm going to go through what the proposed propositions um, entail for the project. The first proposition will be a total of $12,596,132. This utilizes $3.3 .3 million of the capital reserve that you, the district, have now. And it would be a tax neutral proposition to the taxpayers. The scope of the work in Proposition 1 would be replacement of the Eden Elementary windows. It would be the masonry restoration work around those windows and sporadically throughout and around the building. It would be some upgrades to the music rooms, upgrades and renovations to some classrooms. Um, it would be replacement of the sidewalk and parking lot um, right around out front of the building. It would also entail upgrading the high school odd sound and light systems. It would be replacement and taking off um, the cogen and putting it on the grid as well as a generator backup. So in essence, the generator uh, would um, back up the grid and take off um, the cogen currently. The high school um, cafeteria upgrades to the air handler. It'd be upgrades to the high school nurse's office. It would be the replacement of the bus garage roof and there'll be some minor modifications to the current cogen building itself when that comes off um, cogen and it's put on the grid. I have a question as far as the generator, the people before us said that, before you said that the, the diesel could be used as a generator. So that we will investigate a little bit more based on that information that we heard tonight. Yeah, they were pretty firm on that. Yeah. They said the generator was in good shape and there was, with a little bit of work it could replace a generator so that should reduce the cost correct if, if you agree we're going to look into that because what Dave, when dave martin was here and he obviously knows that like the back of his hand 
Um, he was a proponent of providing a, um, a kilowatt generator for backup power out there. So um, we'll take the information that we learned tonight and kind of look at that. Yep. So then there's a proposition two that's being proposed for $3,283,990. This would not utilize any capital reserves, and it would be a $13 tax increase um, on a $100,000 home, which equates to a 0.73% annual increase. And it's important to note that this tax increase um, would not hit in the year of 2023, um, when the borrowing would actually take place for the proposed um, scope of work for Prop 2. The proposed scope of work in Prop 2 would be some library lighting upgrades in Eden Elementary. It would be renovations to some of the work in the main office in Eden Elementary. It would be building mounted lighting around Eden Elementary. It would be um, taking and replacing the asphalt top coat at the Eden Elementary tennis court for use for um, instructional space and, and the kids to use during the school. Moving on to GLP, there would be exterior lighting upgrades. Also GLP would be door and HVAC work, the completion of that work. Um, some of the doors were replaced in the last capital project, and this would be the completion of the remainder of those doors in GLP. There would be some high school library renovation work. Also exterior lighting at the high school. The high school tennis courts would um, be replaced and slid down and relocated converting the old tennis courts into new parking spaces and then ultimately developing new tennis courts. And we have um, some pictures to show you of that proposed plans. And lastly would be upgrading the exterior lighting around the um, bus garage. It's important to note that Prop 2 um, cannot pass without Prop 1 passing. So we wanted to show you some photos of the scope that we've been talking about as well and um, some potential options for looking into the future. So first picture, um, one you're very familiar with is the front of uh, the elementary building. The windows, they're all the old single hung windows. They were put in around the 80s. There's a lot of problems with them. And as well, you can see that white staining below the windows that's actually on the brick now. That's from the windows itself. Um, so that's part of the masonry restoration that Nick was talking about. So that picture there, here's a rendering of what it would look like in the future. So we'll be talking about windows as well once uh, if everything passes and we get the project kicked off. We are working with a vendor who um, is willing to install a couple of those windows beforehand. So we're hoping he does that fairly soon and those are going to be done on the front of the building. So once those are in people can see them, they can come in with uh, the proper permissions and stuff and actually work work how the levers work and see how it, how it operates for everyone and make sure the teachers are on board with the operation that the district chooses. Here's a picture of the back of the building uh, from the loading dock. And there's with the cleaned up masonry and new windows. And what we would do too is we'd work with uh, previous photos of the building that, you know, the original windows, we'd want to make it look as original as possible. And we would work within the State Historic Preservation Office in order to get that um, up to their standards and make sure it works best for the school. So it'd be energy efficient, they'd be operational well, uh, obviously emergency escape windows would all work, um, you know, to today's standards, but they would look like windows of the past. Nurse's office is one we talked about at the high school. If you're familiar with that, it's kind of in the back now that you access through a hallway. Um, so it'd be pretty much renovating that entire space to make it more welcoming when you walk in. There's someone immediately there to, uh, to you know, decide what you need and you know, help you further. Here's just some examples of, of newer nurse's offices. Music suite at this school um, hasn't been updated in quite some time. The finishes are definitely outdated. There's just a couple examples of some new, new spaces. There's learning opportunities as far as band um, and possible storage as well that would help with that space. Middle school, high school library that's in Prop 2. Again, that space would be uh, brought up to today's standards and we would work with the district to do determine you know, what the needs are of that space. 
Um, again, these are a couple of renderings from some other spaces and the picture on the right, that's a, a local library. The bottom one I chose, um, cause it kind of reminded me of the high school library, how it has those little nooks already in there. Right now there's books in there, but those could be reading areas or, or something along that line. Next is the tennis court that Nick was talking about. So if you look at this photo now, this is the current layout. So you can see the existing parking lot above it is the six tennis courts, um, which I think you guys are currently using three or maybe even two due to some cracks that are there. So what uh, the district's looking at proposing would be moving them uh, to the west and still having six courts. It would be a little closer to the district and then where the existing four are to the right, that would become parking. Uh, which during football events or anything up at the turf field, you guys uh, have a little bit of a lack of parking. So that would help with that. And any special events, the play, graduation, it would really uh, help free up some of that space. Can you take a minute on the um, current condition of the tennis courts um, and uh, a simple question of why, would, why don't we just fix those tennis courts? So the current tennis courts, uh, if you get a chance to go out there and take a look, there is multiple cracks that run through them that you could, um, they're wide enough, you could put your hands right into it. And part of that problem is, is the drainage that comes down. So a lot of the area here kind of funnels down towards the high school and runs directly below those. So they've always had problems with shifting, which causes those, those cracks. So we've had engineers look at that space and de determine kind of how we could move forward. And we've looked at other fixes where it's kind of like, like a, a elastomeric, so kind of has some like rubber properties to it, a paint that could go over top of it. And they'll only guarantee that for a few years tops. So, and it's not a cheap fix. So any fix with that's kind of temporary, they're, they're not willing to necessarily guarantee it for long. So redoing them the proper way with new drainage below uh, would take care of the problem. And if I'm not mistaken, the tennis courts have already been fixed. I mean, we've tried uh, numerous times, I do believe. Correct. Right. I mean, over yeah. the last call it 20 years or whatever, they there's been an effort to repair those cracks. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say on the cheap because it certainly wasn't cheap, but to do patchwork on them and it just hasn't worked. And now we have cracks that are two inches wide. Right. With the size of them and the amount. It's just, it's too hard to fix that without actually replacing the area by it. It just constantly pulls apart and causes an issue. So it, it made sense at the time, um, also listening to um, some of the folks helping develop this, that some additional parking was needed. So it made sense to utilize some of that sub base under the current tennis courts to develop into additional overflow parking and therefore move the tennis courts closer to the district entrance or the district doors so that you can get to them more easily. With that additional parking as well, um, like at the turf field and the other parking lots that we installed, there's underground storage that comes into place. So we'd have to make um, drainage and, and things up to current standards, which would also help stopping a lot of that rain that goes to those tennis courts even get there um, in the first place. I know when well, we used to have football, it seems so long ago, but it wasn't really that long ago. There were cars parked all over the lawn, everywhere on a on a Friday night game. And it was exciting to see the volume of people, but we, we spent a lot of time mowing our lawn and trying to make it look nice and to have cars all over it. Uh, this parking lot will, will go a long way in kind of correcting that part of the problem. So in regards to drainage too, that's gonna, cause I think that parking lot has some drain issues. Um, so the new drainage would kind of clear that up as well too. It should help with that. We're not, uh, there may be some small pieces that we're directly uh, fixing with that, maybe some touch basins or something. Um, but even that, just having the additional drainage would help in the area. All right, so next steps um, and major dates. So tonight, um, with the information that you've, you've received based on this presentation, um, you'll have the approval, um, if you wish, as far as the seeker. Next thing would be the public informational flyer that would be going out to the community members um, around November 12th. So they would start to see those into their mailboxes for more information. And then they can look through that informational flyer, mostly of the information that we're presenting here tonight, as well as additional information. 
um, in that newsletter. And then there's going to be two public meetings um, that the community members can come and ask any questions about the proposed capital project. Those are um, proposed as November 18th at 6 p.m. as well as December 9th at 6 p.m. And then ultimately through all of that, um, there will be a December 15th, um, 2020 um, proposed referendum vote for the community. So after um, a successful vote, what are the next steps? The next steps um, would be getting right into the design and SCD review. So that would be started in January of 2021 after a successful referendum vote in December. And that would take um, approximately a year to not only design, but then you also need to submit it to the state education department for approval. Once the state education department approves that, then they give Art the blessing to go out on the street um, for bidding the work. So that's the next phase as far as bid and award. You'll see there is January and February of 2022. And then construction would start um, in February of 2022 and conclude in 2024. So with that, um, we'll open it up to any questions that the board may have. So Nick, with the current uh, unusual things going on in the country, including New York State, are you seeing projects being voted on, being approved, go into SED and, and coming out of SED in a, in a year's time with approvals? Yes. There was just a recent um, public uh, vote that was successful um, just last week in the area. Um, as far as from a community standpoint. And then also um, SED is still um, working um, remotely. They are starting to come back now into the office full time and they're, they're still approving plans and, and getting them through the system. I know on our last capital project, it was something like nine months or something like that. Do you, do you sense that this one is longer or are we still in that sort of a time? Frame? No, they've actually um, decreased the review time, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, I think last time on their website that I checked was about six to 10 weeks. Um, as far as review, it was, it was a lot longer, you know, about a year ago. Um, but they have actually improved on that review time, which is great. I, th I think when we put last project in, I think it was like 35 weeks right. was the estimated review time. So they've come down quite a bit since then. What would be the, you know, when I mentioned before about the people before you, which you heard saying we could use the, the diesel, what, what would be, what's the cost of the, the generator that you put in uh, your budget? So one is I kind of want to come back to that and clarify what I, I need to understand more. I thought what he was referring to is you do have switch gear and everything out there you heard him talk about. Um, so this would actually be the generator backup for the whole entire high school. So um, I think what he was referring more to is the transfer switches and whatnot that we can oh, tie he into. Said, he said, if I understood it right, that we could keep the diesel, which is in fine shape, to be a backup generator for the school. So, and that's what I heard. Yeah, he did. I, I was a good listener for 40 years as an attorney. That, that was my understanding. Yeah. The one thing I did hear mention was that it could be an emergency backup generator. Um, so I think what he said, what he meant with that, and again, we have to clarify exactly what he is, that that would back up the emergency systems in the school. So that would keep um, a certain amount of lights on for emergency exits, as well as fire alarm system and the uh, like elevator and things of that nature. Uh, where part of the things that we looked into was a full backup, just Correct. in case that does happen. Similarly, that what was done in the last capital project here at this current building, there's a very large generator out here in the parking lot that backs up majority of all this building. And, and that generator in the parking lot here runs on natural gas, right? Correct. And so a diesel, presumably, if it were on for an extended period of time, could potentially need to be refilled where a natural gas that is correct. would just continue to run, which would be significantly better. And what I have at my house, I wouldn't want to be running out there with a diesel tank filling up my diesel generator if I didn't need to. Yeah, and it is something we do, I wanna look into as well. I have a lot of notes on the back of my page what they were talking about, um, just so I can clarify that with the engineers as well. You guys, time frame 
on coming off cogen is probably summer of 22. So I was looking at that a little bit more. Um, I would like to say 2023, um, you would probably be on the grid, um, looking at our design schedule and trying to sneak that in and get all the parts and pieces for the summer of 22 and it'll probably lag into the beginning of 2023, working um, with the grid. Uh, we'll get a lot of the components that we need um, to not disrupt any of, the, any of the students and the learning during that summertime, but also working with the grid, it's quite a lengthy process. So my goal is to try to have you on the grid in 2023 at the latest. And, and I just wanna say, um, I know that this is probably a hard time to put this project through, but I'm glad uh, the windows are the number one thing on your list. I taught in this building for many, many years. And um, you mentioned that there were some problems with the windows, but it seems like you're showing us how they'll look nice and it'll be a nice cosmetic improvement. But I really want the community to know that we've had safety issues with those windows. We had a couple windows that actually fell out on people. Uh, we've had rain pouring in when the windows were closed. Uh, they're very difficult call to open. I know they're telling teachers that they should have airflow all the time, but there were times there were teachers who could not open windows, nor could they close windows. So I really want you to stress too that not only was it's going to be really looking nice, but this is a, a major uh, safety issue and um, that these windows really need to be replaced. So if nothing else, we need to go through with this project uh, because this is so important. So Mike, can you explain the, the two windows types that you're gonna to attempt to install prior to the vote? Sure, so uh, what we're gonna do is they're gonna install the two, like we mentioned, and one is gonna be what the typical operation would be, um, at least what we've discussed to this point for the majority of the windows. So every classroom needs to have two exits out. If it has a door to the outside, that's great. If not, it needs to be a window to a certain size. So because of that, we're gonna to have to do a different type of window in there and that is gonna be a single hung. So that's gonna be similar to the windows you have now that opens all the way up and then someone could climb out of there if they needed to. The other windows in the classroom or at least for the sample is gonna be an awning window. So that's gonna be like one more like in your house where it has a crank and it kind of opens out this way. So it opens and gets the same amount of airflow based on the sides and the bottom being open but it doesn't open all the way so someone could get out. So we're gonna see one of each one of those and that will allow everyone to kind of operate it, see how it works, see what they like. And then we can obviously adjust it from there based on the project. So you'll see on this rendering, the reason I went back is to your point, they are very large windows. Um, if you look at this picture, now they're sectioned into three openings to make the window smaller because they are now two sections and it's such a large window that um, it becomes kind of cumbersome to open and try to operate and, and so on so and with one thing i forgot to mention with the awning window because it doesn't open as much what the plan is is that the bottom piece opens like this as well as the top piece so you would have a crank on the on the bottom or when i say top piece i guess i mean middle if you're looking at the picture here so that way you would have two windows that open if it's raining you could still keep them open because the rain will kind of wash right off of that window and you can use them all the time they will have screens with the exception of the emergency egress window because you can't have anything in the way if that's needed. One other last interesting point about this is we actually got original photos of the building when it was built. And these windows that are shown in the rendering now mimic kind of that original design when the building was built with the three, the three over three, we call it. So, so we're hoping to work with SHPO through that. Um, it, can, it can be a difficult practice, practice uh, like National Grid, you know, they're, they're a tough group. Uh, but it really would be a benefit to the school and we have seen it work in the past. Um, it would really help lighten up those windows and it would just make the inside of the rooms uh, great as well. And part of what we're looking at too, if you look at the windows now from the inside, it's, it has the nice wood trim around everything that was original and then it has the white vinyl window inside. This actually would have a wood finish on the inside. So we would try and match that wood to the existing as best we can. Um, in order to kind of make that a little more uh, flawless combination between the two. To kind of, uh, kind of piggyback what Ellen had said, it, it, 
the windows will look nice, but they're needed. And the, the same thing with the code gen. Keeping the code gen running is not free. I mean, we're probably going to end up spending $120,000 to keep it running until it can be replaced. And if we were going to keep it, we'd be spending another $225,000 at least beyond that. In addition, which is a big misnomer, which during the last capital project, it was important to point out, so I might as well start pointing it out now. It runs, uh, um, the cogen runs on natural gas, but it's not our natural gas. I mean, we have to buy the natural gas. We have a gas well, but that gas well doesn't run cogen. It pro provides very little gas. So it's important for the community to know that if, if we could have a co-generator running on our natural gas, well, then that would be awesome, but that we don't produce anywhere near enough to run cogen. Any other questions that we could address for you tonight? Have you guys bid anything of late? I know we're, you know, a year plus out before any possible bidding, but uh, what's the what's the bidding results coming in right now? I just know building materials are through the roof. Sure, um, we've actually had uh, we just opened some very successful bids within the last uh, couple of weeks, and the interesting um, point of view is that contractors um, are being pretty aggressive in the fact that. They're all concerned like every one of us are as far as keeping their employees employed and trying to get backlog on their books. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing a pretty good increase as far as um, um, folks coming out and putting bids in on bid day. Any other questions? Thanks guys. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Do we have a request to withdraw specific items from consent, the consent agenda? All right. So we can move to the next. that recommended that upon the recommendation of the action of the superintendent, consensus items be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. This is the approximate position and time that the board has designated to receive statements from individuals and groups. The board will review all statements, then respond appropriately at a future meeting. All persons in attendance are required to sign the attendance sheet and designate their representation status. For example, parent, teacher, bus driver, chamber of commerce, etc. There's a two minute time limit. Hello, I'm Colleen Gaglione, I'm a PTA president and um, a parent. I'm excited it's my last term as um, PTA president as I will be winding down my final years of my last student in the district. Um, and I wanna say thank you very much to the board. Unfortunately, we did not come bearing gifts, but we do appreciate you every day, I promise. And I wanna welcome our student reps. You have the two best students up there. And I also wanted to just say, I have been subbing for the school, um, for the nurse. And I wanna really say that I really appreciate the administration, um, all of the principals, Mary Maxim. Um, as a parent, I'm fortunate enough to be able to see this and um, we're very lucky that our children are going into school very safe. Um, and without the support of all of you, um, it's a lot of extra work, especially on the poor nurse who's new, um, but she's wonderful. So hopefully with um, your continued support, um, things will improve um, and I do love the outlay of the nurses uh, station for the capital project. So hopefully people vote for that as well. And I agree with Mrs. Kindly about the windows. Um, and that's it. So I hope you have a good year. Thanks, Colleen.
I happen to be here tonight, so I just wanted to say a couple things regarding the musical. I'm Matt Gould, I'm a parent. I've directed the high school musical for the last two years. Who knows, uh, this year. <laughs> uh, we've begun discussions uh, with the high school and the middle school principals about what our options might look like. Regarding that, I just thought I'd bring you guys all to speed with that. We have not really begun discussions there, but we'll begin probably next week. Um, we really don't know what our options will be. We, there are some virtual streaming options now that are provided by licensing companies that were not available even a year ago because of COVID. So we'll be looking at those options as well. Ideally, we'd love to be on a stage, but who the heck knows at this point. Uh, but looking back at last year, uh, school closed, I think four days after our last performance. We were grateful <laughs> that we were able to to get ours in, we were in the uh, running for the Kenny Awards. Those got shut down. Uh, four of the 10 schools involved in the awards did not get to perform their shows. So we were pretty blessed to be able to do that. that. Thank you to the board and to the administration for the incredible support there. Um, it was a fantastic year and it's gonna be uh, an interesting one this year, but I just thought I'd let you know, uh, we're gonna go through a process. I don't even know that I'm officially, um, <laughs> The musical director this year yet because we don't even know if we're doing one so um, just wanted to, to express my thanks to this board uh, for your support of the arts and looking at the upcoming um, proposal that was just laid out I think it would be important as you talk about the high school auditorium with the lighting and the audio that that's a classroom and uh, the more we talk about that to the community and it's not just about a musical performance uh, we have uh, students that come in and volunteer for lighting and for audio that we've been very limited in us being able to do the last number of years because it's been so outdated it's almost pointless to have them work on this stuff but with new equipment in there it can truly be a technology classroom for us and i hope that that's uh, made note of to the community as part of this process so thanks hey matt quick question so Time frame normally for musical auditions to normally, I know it's a mid March, yeah. um, just as everything's being adjusted. I mean, have, have we started considering a May possible product? I, I'm just throwing. Realistically, no. Um, unless we think we could really make that an in person production on stage with an audience, I would say I would keep it on the same track if we're really. Realistically, looking at making this a virtual production, I would keep it the first week of March, especially considering how the sports schedules have been shifted. We have a lot of students that do both. Uh, we've landed on the first weekend in March. Uh, it's been very successful for us because it butts right up to then the first week of spring sports after that, and most of the winter sports are complete. So it's a great window for us, and I think it still would be. Obviously, uh, we have to back up our Rehearsal process, we're doing all that online, what that even looks like. Typically, we do auditions the last week of October, first week of November, so they come right up. We take a little break, we get rolling before uh, Christmas break. So we'll do some rehearsal in November and some more rehearsal in December, take a break. It basically, by starting earlier like that, it gives us the opportunities to let the students and families have their Christmas break, have their February break. We do not hold formal rehearsals even then, which is two weeks before our show. So this schedule is going to have to change. Ideally, we'd like to keep it the same weekend in March. Um, we would be willing, obviously, to move it if we thought we could actually do performance on a stage in April or May. That becomes really difficult with sports and backing into graduations and, and everything else that happens, you know, you know what family schedules are like come April and May. It's bonkers. So um, that's a long answer to a short question. No, just <laughs> trying to figure out all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, realistically, we'd like to stay in March. Um, realistically, we'd love to do a show on stage or at least a semblance of that. Um, when we say virtual, you might think Zoom. Um, some of the rights would allow us to actually record students performing without an audience. Some of the rights would allow us to record students individually and then edit that together, which happens to be something that I can bring to the table too. So uh, there are lots of options there. Um, I think we start with the ideal and we just have to work our way back from that. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else? We can move to new business. Appointments.
business re resignations. I'm skipping down there. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the resignation of Eden Elementary Cafeteria Monitor, Cheryl Dunmire, be accepted effective October 14th, 2020. Note, Cheryl has resigned in order to accept the hall monitor position at Eden Middle School and High School. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. Now we can go to appointments. For B. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Patty Dallas, be appointed on probation as a cafeteria monitor effective October 5th, 2020 and ending April 4th, 2021. Salary is based upon CSEA contract level two, step one. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, after successfully completing her probationary period, Helen Nab be granted tenure as a social worker effective September 1st, 2020. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Joseph Villafranca be appointed on probation as a bus driver, effective October 5th, 2020, and ending April 4th, 2021. Salary is based upon CSEA contract level four, step one. Second. Any discussion? Level nine. I, I've got to make oh. a uh, correction. It's level oh, nine, sorry. step one. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, Cheryl Dunmire be appointed on probation as a hall monitor effective October 15th, 2020 and ending April 14th, 2021. Salary is based upon CSEA contract level two, step two. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. That upon on the recommendation of the superintendent, Sharon McAllister be appointed on probation as a cafeteria monitor, effective October 15th, 2020 through April 14th, 2021. Salary is, is as per CSEA contract level two, step one. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation recommendation of the superintendent, the State Environmental Quality Review Act resolution and supporting documentation for proposed 15,880,122 dollars, two part 2022 capital improvement project be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, a resolution calling for a public vote on the proposed $15,880,122 two-part 2022 capital improvement project and prescribing the form of the legal notice of the vote be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the external audit, single audit, and extra class reports for the year ending June 30th, 2020, prepared by Drescher and Malecki, CPAs, be approved. Second. Any discussion? Those are the reports that were presented at the last board meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the 2018-2019 and 2019-2020 corrective action plan letters be approved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. 
that upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the bus routes be adjusted as per the new schedule effective September 19, 2020. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carried. Business report. Part of the discussion that Don Suppen, board president, and I had about a month ago, he was wondering what have been the costs for the 2020-2021 school year related to COVID. Some of those costs and highlights are the sneeze barrier, sneeze guards and barriers were approximately $42,000. Face shields were $1,100. Disposable face masks were $12,900. Cloth face masks, two were provided to every staff and student. Those are $7,600. Gloves so far are $10,786. Sanitizing supplies, $36,328. And I just want to make a sidebar on there that we anticipate the monthly cost for the sanitizing buckets that are in each of the classrooms that are used to wipe down the classrooms between students are gonna cost us $2,400 a month going forward for the rest of the year or until the pandemic ends. Then we have thermal scanners, they were $63,000. Those are the crowd scanners that tell us if a student has an elevated temperature. And then we have some FDA approved ones that we can use if we need to spot check a student or they're used for the staff and they actually tell the temperature of the individual. We spent $911 on thermometers, good old fashioned um, thermometers, touchless so that we're not spreading disease. Air filtration, $5,000. Those were to put MERV filters in to increase the sanitization of our air handler systems. And we have some anticipated costs for additional, that weren't budgeted costs for sports due to additional runs and safety on the field and unemployment costs. Now, unemployment sounds like, what do you mean unemployment? But the school district does not pay a fee or a percentage of salaries every year to unemployment. We pay the actual unemployment costs. And while we haven't laid staff members off, we have staff members who worked here in the past year who we get caught in the unemployment for. So, so far as of September 30th, our grand total is approximately $273,000 and the number keeps coming. The other next item I'd like to talk about is tax collections. It's that time of year and the tax collections are going as planned, but right now as of past weekend, we only collected 62,000, 62% of the taxes, which typically at that point in time, we've already collected 72%. Now we're not sure if that's just how the calendar is falling or if there are other issues of an economic sort, but I just wanted to report to the board that the tax collections are underway and we are receiving, we've already received 62% from the town clerk who collects for us. So Laura, question, reoccurring costs. Like I know <clears throat> the uh, thermal scanners like are one-time costs, the thermometers uh, maybe is a one-time cost, but what are we looking at, uh, I guess, monthly reoccurring COVID-19 costs? It doesn't have to be exact. Well, I don't have that estimated out because we're, we're going as we go along and this was only through the end of September. So now as we'll start to see a rhythm of where we can go, I can report on that next month. We do know that sanitizing supplies are gonna be coming again and we're following any recommendations. So if for example, we should be advised to change filters again, if this continues, that would be another reoccurring cost, but we really don't know yet and everything changes daily for us. Superintendent's report. 
Thank you. So uh, just a special thank you to the Board of Education for your volunteer service to the district, the community, and our students. Your efforts and professionalism are greatly appreciated. As a collaborative team, you've done much to improve this district. On a personal note, I want to thank each of you for making my transition to the district so welcoming. Um, I appreciate the challenge to improve our district, and I certainly appreciate the trust that you've bestowed on me uh, and our joint development of, of our return to school plans. So thank you for all you do. It's, it's much appreciated from me and from your, your administrative team as well. Um, I do want to give you an update on our return to school plans. Um, and, and things are going really well right now, particularly in our community. Uh, I'm very proud of, of uh, all the folks involved, but I, I want us to continue to take a cautious approach about returning students to the classroom on a full-time basis. Recently, the governor announced a new color-coded system that will be imposed on districts if infection rates increase in their area. There are many questions about this plan, including what the thresholds will be and what is considered an area. For example, Western New York is quite a broad area with significant differences in population density and with infection rates. We do not know how the new system will be implemented other than the mention of zip codes being a factor. Zip codes do not tell the story of who populates or who does not populate a district. Additionally, we are now just entering the yearly respiratory virus season. It's safe to say that we will see an increase in students and staff members experiencing symptoms that may or may not be related to COVID-19. It makes sense to move cautiously, even though, even though our district is thus far faring very well in the mitigation of the virus. Let's not forget that we are bound by the guidelines developed by the governor, the state education department, the New York State Department of Health, and the Erie County Department of Health. While the guidelines have changed, they have not become less restrictive. Based on the current guidelines, we need to be cognizant of the capacity of our classrooms, and let's recognize that sometimes doing things well makes it seem like we could do even more. For, furthermore, our staff, our teachers, our custodians, our cleaners, our administrators, really everybody are starting to get to a comfort level with handling their professional responsibilities in very new and different ways. Let's continue to support each other and this important work while maintaining a safe and cautious approach to the health of our students and staff. On a different and very positive note, one that is directly related to chocolate milk, I'm happy to announce that the USDA has provided notice that the availability of free breakfast and lunch will continue for the remainder of the school year was originally supposed to end at the end of uh, December, and they've extended it for the entire school year. So all students are eligible to receive two free meals every school day through the month of June 2021. Finally, and this is, this is really exciting for me, um, Friday, October 16th, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing your thunder down there, but you, you will understand when I'm done talking how cool this is for me personally, has right? been designated as Tractor Day. It's a fairly well-kept secret, but one my family knows well that I have a, a pretty deep infatuation with tractors. And every time we drive by one, I say I need one. I have no use for one, I just want one. So the fact that I'm going to see our students drive their, their, their rigs and their tractors onto campus and have a parade on that day is really, really exciting. I'm hoping that uh, someone offers a ride, hint, hint. Uh, tractors will be on campus at 6.45 in the morning and the parade kicks off uh, around 1.10 p.m. Uh, really, really excited that we can continue this tradition and, and do something that's very normal for, for our district. And I think that the students are certainly going to enjoy, and I know that I'm certainly going to enjoy it as well. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? The students who aren't scheduled for school that day, are they allowed to go to the... Tractor? I heard two words of your question. Sorry, the students who aren't scheduled, the tractor, my gosh, I'm hearing word finding issues. So you're asking are students who are not attending school Thank you. allowed to drive the tractor school? Yes. Day? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right, Abby and Caleb, you're up. You're also ecstatic for tractor day, just to say? Yes, very excited. <laughs> I think just in general, it's safe to say that students are really feeling the absence of um, school-wide activities that we normally have. You know, we've had dozens by this point in a traditional year. There's just homecoming, pep rallies, spirit weeks. Um, so we as a uh, council are gonna be looking for more COVID safe options for um, just for some community togetherness because we're definitely missing a lot of that, you know, spirit weeks and such, but we'll definitely be bringing some 
ideas to the table for discussion sometime soon. So. And then with um, with school in general and the school days um, academically, um, just the general feeling I'm getting from um, my my peers is that um, it's going really well with how um, with Zoom classes and the asynchronous stuff. Um, some students um, are um, feeling overwhelmed with some work, but that's kind of what's given in a given year. But um, with considering the circumstances and considering um, all of the new facets that us as students have to deal with now, it's um, we're able to work really well with each other and the teachers have been a huge, huge help and a huge asset for us to be able to um, succeed in academically this year. So um, overall, it's going better than at least what myself and fellow uh, peers um, originally anticipated, um, which is um, which is very encouraging for us right now. And the availability of guidance counselors and um, mm -hmm. Mr. Lyons and Mr. Zerboni just day to day has been super helpful for a lot yes, of students, myself sure. especially. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. <laughs> Board report roundtable. Um, I'm sorry. Am I? Am I? I just want wondering, especially having two students here, if we could just have a little discussion about when you guys are um, participating in your, your virtual days and you're able to maybe log into a live classroom, how, how, how is it as far as like your auditory feedback? Like is, and you can be honest, I'm just, I'm curious. I think in general, audio, definitely there's a lot to be improved. I think everybody's doing the best that they can, but you know, the average teacher paces around the classroom, okay. likes to um, gesture a lot, a lot of things that we, when you're not in the classroom, you definitely miss out on. But also that's just every teacher growing more accustomed to using these new technologies. But um, also I know a lot of teachers have been getting headsets, like okay. headsets, which has been super helpful, but um, some teachers are finding difficulty um, connecting them to their computers because Bluetooth is disabled on a lot of school computers. Uh, so, okay. but I think it's all just a massive learning curve. Mm -hmm. okay. And there has been um, improvement over the year with teachers being able to adapt to it. So it hasn't all been like, um, just with some teachers struggling early in the year, they have been able to find like what have you saying with Bluetooth headphones or a um, webcam with a Bluetooth speaker on it. It has, um, teachers have been able to um, adapt and progress with that but you know there's still obviously areas improvement and it just being able to replicate a in-class person experience over a zoom call is next to like uh, impossible but just with the circumstances it has been um, working out well and getting better each each week knows to be better okay. i mean if we could do anything to support the teachers i know money is probably tight but I don't know if we can put our feelers out there and to see what they need and what would improve or. Yeah, I think it definitely makes a lot of sense to, uh, to reach out to the, the teaching staff about what equipment they may need, what training they may need. Um, there's, there's already a, um, a, a process in place for, for tech requests and it's really um, been working uh, quite well lately. Um, but this is a, a good conversation for me to have with Mr. Savoni and, and, and Mr. Lyons as well. So thank you for that feedback. I appreciate it. I think also I've, I've heard from every teacher that tech requests are majorly backed up with all of the tech that, you know, we've added this year. So I think it's fair to say that it's probably just in the process of working itself out. I guess there's a question maybe to Lucinda and maybe the staff. I'm not familiar, all that familiar with Google Meet or and with Zoom, but I know, I think on Teams, every time you exit a Teams session, it says, what was the quality of the meeting? Does that happen in Google Meet? And if so, are we gathering that data for feedback to the teachers saying, hey, this was a, a quality, whether it was the session, but it's, it's the quality of the video, quality of, of, the, of the, um, the audio in the, in the system. I, can Google Meet do that or? You know. So with most classes, I think all of the classes I do, um, we do Zoom calls and I know Zoom does not do that. Um, however, some teachers do ask us like how things are going, but I, I'm not sure about Google Meets because I haven't used those for any of my classes specifically. Listen, if we can look into that, I think it's a tab inside of Zoom that you can click on. I don't know if it's in our version or not, but I know 
I think you can do that. So it, it'd just be good feedback for the teachers because I've actually um, listened in on a few classes virtually and to say reading Shakespeare in a play by the class doesn't go over too well if you're virtual. We also have the ability to type in the chat a lot of the time, which does help. But no, I'm in that same class with Carly and it is difficult, <laughs> but we work it out. Do you have anything else then? The board report? All right, I got one thing here. So I have a shining star recognition for Miss Jennifer Horschel um, for outstanding participation for the Erie County Association of School Boards. So I'd like to present this to Jen for her 2019-2020 service. Oh, that's super sweet. Thanks. There you go. Thank you. Wow. Oh, thanks so much. Shush. There you go. Wow. Oh, Thank you. I accept this award as I just told them I couldn't go to a meeting tomorrow. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I just want to thank a lot of people. Um, so for those that don't know, my wife teaches fourth and fifth grade band and she is teaching from home. Um, my office has been in our house for the last 10 years. So it's been kind of nice and kind of quiet up until uh, let's see, about September 14th or so. Um, but I, I understand um, what parents are going through. I understand, especially the younger students, to, to see fourth and fifth graders jump on a Google Meet every half hour, be prompt. Um, very few uh, uh, technology issues per se. You get the, the freezing ones, the audio issues from time to time. Um, but a, a big thank you to all the teachers. I realize how much more you are working um, from, from a point. It's, it's double work. Um, I see it at home. And for our admin, um, you know, to, to basically knock on wood, have no hip cups for, from what we've heard. Um, I just want to thank everybody. It's, it's been a, a challenge and even the technology department. Um, I haven't heard a ton of things other than, I don't know, issues on Weller today or something. <clears throat> Seems to be the Bermuda Triangle of Eden. Um, so I just, I, I just really want to thank. We, we really recognize what, um, what, what everybody's going through. And I, I just want to thank the, the whole Eden community from the, like I said, from the, the parents to the students to, to the staff to the administration uh, for, for getting through this. It's been, I think, a pretty successful uh, opening month plus. So thank you. I, I, my wife's a teacher, and I would just, uh, now that Don mentioned something, I, um, it's, it shouldn't go unnoticed. It's the math is interesting that half the kids in the school equals twice the amount of work for teachers mm -hmm. and it's not going unnoticed. Um, Eden is certainly, um, in my opinion, shining. There's lots of school districts who are having major challenges and we keep fighting through and it's because of our staff and our teachers and our community and it, it is definitely noticed. Yeah, I would. Just I'll piggyback really quick um, and talk about my own personal experiences. I mean, I've the minute I've reached out to any teacher, um, whether it was last the end of last year or this year, I've always, I've gotten an immediate response. The lengths that the teachers are willing to go to to help is almost overwhelming. Like in in a very sincere way, it's I know they're already exhausted and pushed to the limits, and here they are like, well, what else can I do? And it's just. It's beautiful to see, it's heartwarming, and um, the feedback that I've received has been tremendous from the DLP all the way up to the high school. I just, as Don and Jack have said, I can't thank everybody enough. It's, it's a lot of work as an educator myself. You feel like you're just working 24 seven and barely getting by. So my deepest appreciations and gratitude for everything that every single staff member is doing in this district to make this all work. That's it. 
Anybody else? Okay, uh, the next regular Board of Education meeting is Wednesday, November 18th, 2020 at 7 p.m. in the Eden Elementary School Auditorium. That upon the recommendation of the superintendent, the Board of Education enter executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular person or persons. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carried. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs>